This is Mill Street Radio from PRX. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Today we're mastering the art of French cooking. Alex I News, for example, puts a French spin on a very American concept. Uh, well, I, I, I feel very French today, and uh, I thought I should share something with you, a recipe that performs particularly well on French people. <laughs> You'd be maybe surprised to learn that it's based around the burger. What? Yes, French people love their burger, but I made sure not to make enemies, to include some French flavors. We also chat with Jacques Pépin, who recalls his first impressions of the American supermarket. There was only one salad, that was iceberg. You know, <laughs> There was no leek, no shallot. I remember asking for mushroom. And they say IL-5, and that was the canned mushroom. I mean, you didn't have any fresh mushroom. But first, dessert. With us today is food writer and dessert columnist for The Wall Street Journal, Alexandra Cropanzano. She's also the author of Gateau, Surprising Simplicity of French Cakes. Alexandra, welcome to Milk Street. Thank you. Absolutely my pleasure. I love your book. Um, I, I just love this kind of baking, but there's so many things in this book I'm not familiar with. So it's it's lovely when you find a book that sort of opens up a new vista into something you thought you knew. Um, first of all, you moved to Paris. You were, how old were you? 10 or 11 or something? I was 10, yeah. And you move into an apartment that was occupied at one time by Georges Sand. Yes. <laughs> Could you just say a word about that? Like, who was she? And, and how did you manage to end up in that apartment? Absolutely. So I was just starting middle school. My father is a professor, and he had gone to teach in Paris. My mother, Jane Kramer, was the uh, New Yorker correspondent in Europe and had wanted to uh, to spend a couple years there. And I remember the first day I arrived, I, of course, was incredibly nervous and in starting school and learning French. And everybody had told me this incredible apartment belonged to Georges Sand, and I was no idea who she was, but uh, a fantastic, fantastic writer. And in fact, her office was my bedroom. And um, <laughs> it remains a kind of seminal room for me, not just because of, of that kind of classic Paris architecture and the tall windows. Right. And um, but it did it did have us it had a spirit. I was also right down the block from the bakery Poilane. So, so you were I, in, the, in the sixth? I was in the sixth on the Rue du Cherche Midi. Mm -hmm. So oh, right there. And, okay right there. And it was an absolute great neighborhood for food, great restaurants, great bakeries. I loved, loved shopping in that neighborhood for food. So let's just talk about the French cakes in general and their whole approach. You write, a French cake will by and large have less sugar as nuance is prized over sweetness. A bit of salt will bloom the flavors, which I agree with. And of course, a cup of yogurt might add a moist backstage tang. In fact, they have a, a yogurt cake that's based on an actual container of yogurt, right? Yes. And actually, I learned to bake that cake when I was 10. But generally, kids learn by the time they're in kindergarten how to take one little yogurt jar and you use that to measure all of the ingredients. Right. And so it's, it's as simple as can be. I mean, most of the recipes in this book, particularly in the beginning of the book, are literally as simple as having a bowl and one measuring cup. And they, and they also, the flavors are much more interesting. I mean, a pistachio cake is common, for example, or rose water or coconut or whatever, but, the, but it's not just the usual suspects. I mean, I, I love American layer cakes too, but there's more too. diversity in the flavorings, I think, right? It, entirely. And I'm always surprised to realize that, you know, that they have been way ahead in certain things that I feel like we are coming to now. So rose water... A lot of orange blossom water, which I love. Definitely a lot of pistachio, a lot of hazelnut. Right. And one of the things that people laugh at me about is because I do have like an entire cupboard of liquor in my kitchen. <laughs> and it's just because the French really do turn to a bottle of something just to add depth. And it's so easy. And, you know, as soon as you start doing it, it just becomes the norm. But if you're making an apple cake, they'll reach for a bottle of Calvados, hmm. an apple brandy, as opposed to kind of adding more sugar or more vanilla, or they'll add rum and raisins, or they will add some cognac to something if they're, let's say they've made a yogurt cake in the morning and their kids have had it, and then by evening they realize their friends come over. They might just quickly whip up a little glaze with a little bit of cognac and a little bit of powdered sugar, and suddenly this childhood cake turns into a very adult cake. 
Well, that, that gets to something else you said. Um, you talk about savoir faire. You say that distinctly Parisian know-how that blends style and functionality, mm-hmm. including popping a gateau in the oven without anyone even noticing. But it's, it's the idea of improvising. And I think the book really makes the cake uh, it makes the case. <laughs> um, you, you have a pound cake, and I counted 52 variations. So l- let's take the pound cake and, and just take me through a few of the variations, So, just, just so I understand how you think about baking. Absolutely. So, you know, the French really do stick to the classics. They stick to the tried and true. So some of these recipes go back to the Middle Ages. Many of them are at least 100 years old. And once mastered, then you can do anything you want with them, right? So you can add seasonal fruits, you can change spices, you can change glazes, you can add nuts. You know, once you actually have the, the baking part down, then the rest is fun. So it's, you know, it's different zests or it's adding some almond extract or they add a lot of the Italian liquor limoncello for lemon or they'll add prune soaked in a little bit of armagnac or maybe some slivered basil will go into a strawberry cake. Um, I noticed also that butter is often browned for right. that, just that extra depth. Um, Burr patissier, th- this this blew my mind. A, f- a fat content of no less than 99.8%. Isn't American butter like 83 to 84% or something? It is. I think it's actually even only 81%. No, it's, I, I love, so so weekends when I was growing up, we used to rent a house in Normandy. And I think that's where my love of all the apple cakes came in and Calvados. But we would, we would go out there and, you know, Normandy and Brittany obviously are the, are the places where dairy is at its absolute finest. And we would go to the cheese shop and the shopkeeper would scoop up these giant spoonfuls of different kinds of butter whether you wanted butter that was a little bit salted for a sandwich or whether you were baking something that required a very kind of flaky, buttery crust. And um, and everything was very, very much curated to exactly what you were cooking. So we talked about different kinds of butter, about adding liquor. Are there other common things the French do in baking that we don't tend to do here and that we should know about? Well, one of the things the French do in cakes all the time is they will, instead of you know, adding yogurt or sour cream as we might, they will add an entire pint of creme fraiche <laughs> and, and basically guarantee that the cake will be exceedingly rich and, and last really well and be beautifully moist. Um, but they do tend to take a cake and instead of conceiving of a cake as a layer cake, they will simply just make a cake and cut it into layers. And I think it is, again, it's that confidence of knowing, well, maybe the cake hasn't turned out absolutely perfectly, but if you cut it into thin layers and you add a little bit of soaking syrup and you add a little bit of whipped cream and you add a little bit of fruit, nobody's going to know. You can hide all the flaws. So I think there's a, you know, it's a very, very relaxed way of cooking. I mean, I would really go back to, you know, because none of these cakes are expensive to make. So if there's going to be something to splurge on, splurge on the chocolate and splurge on the butter. Those two things are absolutely essential. And then just keeping a bottle of creme de cassis and a bottle of rum around. And sometimes, instead of adding vanilla, just try adding the rum or try adding another liqueur. And there's a big emphasis on seasonal cakes, much more so than here in the States, don't you think? Absolutely. So what is still true very much in Paris is that when you go to the market, you will still only really find seasonal produce. And I think also the French have this wonderful sense that Things are appreciated when they're rare. Like you would never make a Christmas bouche de Noël on another season because part of the joy is is actually having to wait the whole year to have it, yeah. right? But with seasonality, I think that's true also, is, is that there is a French belief that this is the moment to eat this because they're at the peak. And I see that particularly, I mean, definitely all of the citrus fruits are obviously the oranges and the blood oranges are all winter. But one of the things I love in the late spring, kind of early summer is when the fraise des bois, the the little tiny, very, very intensely flavored and perfumed forest strawberries arrive. The entire city, you know, you see people carrying around as though they're carrying Fabergé eggs, these perfect little boxes with tissue paper and these like impeccable tiny strawberries inside. So there really is kind of this this idea, because France essentially is farm to table still and never really left that. So the seasonality is really much more geared towards we need to celebrate this produce because we're not going to have it again for another year. Alexandra, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Chris, it's been absolutely my pleasure to be on. Thank you. 
That was Alexandra Cropanzano. Her latest book is Gateau, The Surprising Simplicity of French Cakes. Next up, it's time to take your calls with my co-host, Sarah Moulton. She's the star of Sarah's Weeknight Meals on Public Television, also author of Home Cooking 101. So, Sarah, you, I think, at the advice of Julia, you trained in in France for a while, right? And right. You, you trained at a French, obviously, French restaurant. I did at a two-star restaurant in Chartres, France, called Henri Quatre. And um, not at her suggestion. <laughs> she signed me up without asking me because <laughs> she just thought it was so important. And how do I say no to Julia? So she set up a situation. It was called a petit stage, a little apprenticeship. Right. And so I got room and board. In exchange, I worked at the restaurant. And um, it was uh, pretty phenomenal. I told you about it before. It was a little rough because the chef was... Um, Amorous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I was insulted because I was a serious chef here in, in Cambridge, in Boston. But I have to say, I learned a ton. And what I really learned, the chef didn't throw anything out, nothing, to the point where when I came back, my food cost, when I went, went back to the chef, you know, as chef at the restaurant, was phenomenal. The Europeans just don't waste food. Whereas at the height of the restaurant boom a few years ago, you might buy 10 pounds of raspberries and use two pounds of them to get the perfect ones right. Right, right. So they're, they're, I, I learned that, among other things. Now let's take a call. Okay. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? This is Roberta Steiner calling from Schenectady, New York, with an altitude question. Schenectady isn't that uh, high altitude, is it? Or did something happen when I wasn't looking? <laughs> no, it's not. And that is the question, because the recipe I'm looking at was developed and tested at altitude in Colorado, 5,000 feet above sea level. So I need to know how I can do this recipe without messing it up. Well, what is the recipe? The recipe is for gluten-free bread for two loaves of baguette. I've had a bad experience with gluten-free baguettes. They're not going to be anything like real baguettes, just so you know that. Well, no gluten-free bread is ever right. as good as the real stuff. But someone has made this for me, and it really is pretty good. Really? Okay. And I thought, oh, okay. yes, very tasty, nice texture, okay. etc. But here's the thing, Roberta. I just think you're asking too much of yourself to try to make a gluten-free baguette and then adjust it from a high-altitude recipe. There's too many variables. Chris? Well, I mean, you have... I mean, I'm glad you like the recipe. The problem with baguette is a real baguette is thin and crisp on the outside and fluffy and light on the inside. And secondly, with high altitude, you have issues of hydration level in the dough. You Uh have issues of Uh how much yeast to use. You have issues of rising time. You have issues of oven temperature. So the baguette is at the that and puff pastry or at the pinnacle of difficulty in the bread pastry world. And now you're adding on a a layer of complexity. So... (laughs) Here's what I think you should do. Just make the recipe and lower the oven temperature a little bit. Is this a a cold ferment or what is this? This calls for one and a half tablespoons yeast, and it rises after everything has been mixed together, dumped into a parchment-lined baguette pan, and then left to rise for 30 minutes. Is this a teaspoon and a half of yeast or a tablespoon and a half? Tablespoon. Just go make it. Reduce the oven maybe 25 degrees and just make it and see what happens. Because, look, you like the recipe. You might want to take the liquid down a little bit, but just try it. See what happens. Okay. It may be that when you're not dealing with gluten, right, that all the advice about high altitude versus, you know, Schenectady doesn't matter as much. It's just a whole different animal. So I don't know. Right. Just do it. I tell you what, I will try it. Yeah. And if I am successful... I will email you and say, it worked out great. Or I'll say, you're right. Or if you tweak it, tell us how you tweak it. No, I want to know because I think, you know what, we would love to try this in our kitchen too. Could you send us the recipe? Because we can have somebody in the kitchen make it here and then we'll call you back. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Uh, This is Jean. Hi, Jean. Where are you calling from? Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts. Pretty close to us. How can we help you? So 
about 20 years ago, friends of mine purchased some beef demi-glaze sauce that came in a nice box with a recipe for a green peppercorn sauce. And we made that recipe two, three, maybe even four times and then lost the recipe and are still able to buy that sauce, but cannot find a comparable recipe. And so we've been struggling with this for a while and hoping you can come up with a better solution. Well, actually, this is a pretty common recipe, steak au pois. Uh-huh. So yeah. I'm sure you've looked it up. First of all, let's just say what demi is, and this has like been pounded uh-huh. into my brain at cooking school. <laughs> it's yeah. half brown stock and half sauce espagnole. But in essence, yeah. it's sort of a reduced, intense should be gelatinous sort of yeah stock yeah extraordinarily thick right so yeah what i here's what i would do i'll just take you through it okay i would season my steak actually i usually season mine an hour ahead of time you know pat it dry sear mm-hmm. it cook it to your you know desired doneness park it on a plate you know let it Right. rest. And then to the pan, I would probably add some red wine, maybe some shallots, the green peppercorns. Okay. You can buy them either in brine or dried. I tend to right. like them in brine. I think they're better. Drain them, yeah. add a couple tablespoons, sort of cook mm-hmm. that down a bit, add some heavy cream, a little mm-hmm. bit of Dijon mustard, and then put mm-hmm. in the demi gloss and you don't need any flour because the demi gloss has got some gelatin in it. It's, you know, it's thick. And the right, cream right. will, if you reduce cream, it just naturally gets thick. And yep. then I'd finish it with a little bit of cognac, salt, and pepper. And then, okay. very, very important, the resting juices from the steak. And I think yeah. you will end up with a okay. sauce that you like. Now, I didn't give you proportions, so that may be a problem. Right. Right. But those are all the elements that I would think should go in there for a proper sauce. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what I ran into trouble with. I found a recipe, but it didn't have you use the juices from the pan. Oh, you always... That was probably what blew me. Yeah. yeah that, you A, wanted the glaze, and yeah. B, want to add the resting juices from the steak. It's, as Madeline Kamen used to say, she was a famous cooking teacher in the Boston area, maybe you've heard of her, she used to say you have to marry the sauce with the protein, mm-hmm. and this is mm-hmm. how you marry them. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Chris is okay. glaring at me. Let's see what he has to say. No, okay. I have nothing yeah. to add except I wish Sarah would cook this for me because I haven't had steak au pois <laughs> like since that. 1978. It's so good. But it's, you know, it's one of those. Oh, my God. It's funny. There's some recipes that are delicious that have passed uh-huh. out of like passed out of the repertoire now. It belonged back. But, right. but it's steak and peppercorns. Why yeah. why is this not yeah. maybe it's got it's got a creamy sauce. But it's so good. Yeah. It's so, so good. delicious. Yeah. You know? Old school. <laughs> well, I love it. But it was so good. Yeah. Sometimes the old ways are best, as they say. Uh-huh. Jean, thanks for calling. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. This is Mill Street Radio. If you're stumped in the kitchen, give us a call anytime. Our number is eight five five Four two six nine eight four three. One more time, eight five five four two six nine eight four three. Or you can simply email us at questions at milkstreetradio.com. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hello, this is Rebecca from Montgomery, New Jersey. Hi, Rebecca. How can we help you today? So I have trouble perfectly cooking my baked goods like cakes and breads, and I was wondering why recipes don't use internal temperature as an indicator for doneness. Is it possible to use temperature, or do you have any other tips and tricks to help? No, I think it's absolutely possible, and I think it's just because it's relatively new technology for people to be using thermometers. So sure, what are you looking to take the temperature of, just like a regular chocolate cake? Yeah, like for chocolate cake especially, because I can't tell if it's golden brown. Uh, Roughly, you're looking for 200 to 205, and you put the instant read into the center of the cake, not touching the bottom, you know? Right. Yeah. And how about like a sourdough loaf? Yeah, uh, sourdough, a a typical white bread, like an enriched bread, is like 190 to 195. I'd say 195. Uh, I used to make a sourdough all the time. It was about 205. 
I found that if it was under 205, the bread was a little sticky inside. You know, I wanted to fully mm-hmm. cook it. So 205 to 208 with, with a rustic bread and 195 with a typical enriched like white bread is, is what I use. Yeah. And, and by the way, it's a great question. And I've asked the same question for years. Like, why not use internal temps? And you can. Cheesecake, for example, which everybody overbakes, like 145, right, to one. 145 to 150 is sort of the sweet spot, but uh, that's a great cake to use with an instant read thermometer because you can't press the top to see if it's done, right? No. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, All right, take Rebecca. Care. We're glad we, get, we were able to help you so quickly. Yes, thank you. Have a good day. Take care. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? This is Sue Wild. How can we help you? Um, I had a question about a spice mix that I bought when we were on vacation in France. Mm-hmm. It was in the south of France, Nice, Antibes. Mm-hmm. And I love the market that they have in Antibes. And they had a spice merchant selling a whole bunch of spices. One of the ones I picked up, I don't recognize what it was. And I'm curious what is in it and how to use it. What did it look like, smell like, taste like? The name of it is Oriflam, O-R-Y-F-L-A-M. And it's a powder, uh-huh. and it is a very deep rust pumpkin color. Does it have a strong aroma? No, it doesn't have a strong aroma. Hmm. I have no idea. I mean, there are things like a chiote powder, like right from Central America or Mexico, they probably don't have a strong smell, but are used in cooking. Did you Google Oriflame? Did you Google yeah, it? Nothing came up. Okay, what? I'm going to Google it as Sarah's talking. Okay, so let me ask, you, ask a question. Did they suggest what recipes you should use this in? What kind of things? I'll be honest with you. Speaking English and French at the market was difficult. So you didn't understand what they were so recommending? I didn't. Okay. I'm going to go by the color then. The trouble is, because you haven't tasted it, we don't really have a point of reference, but I was going to also recommend a natto seeds ground up. Mm. Uh, uh, that's an interesting idea. Because yep. they're used, for yeah. example, orange cheddar cheese gets its color from a natto seeds. Right. Um, that could be. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a good one. And so I could see in the south of France this vendor trying to sell a spice that's nowhere near as expensive as saffron, but yet will give the color that you might want in one of those Provencal kind of dishes. So I don't know. Chris, are you having any luck Googling? There's a beauty <laughs> cream called Oriflam. <laughs> it's the yeah, beauty yeah, spice. I had too. Well, no, I, yeah, yeah, I, I think the answer is this is something that is there for color. And if it has no aroma, it probably we doesn't have, have a much lot of flavor. flavor. You know what? I think you're onto something. Because I think my guess is that if you put it in a dish, it gives it a really nice, like a paille type coloring. Right. Can I just add something though? Mm-hmm. Sometimes people sell things that are used as topical applications for beauty products. So you know, this could be like a soap <laughs> of some kind. I mean, or something you add to an emollient or a hand cream. It doesn't necessarily mean it is edible because it was sold with spices that are. I think whatever it is, it's there for color. Yeah. Yeah. There's no strong aroma to it. I'm gonna find out the answer to this. Okay. Yeah. Well, then would you please share it with all of us? I will. I'm fascinated. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you so much for calling. You've given us a clue, and we have to solve it. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, take care. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Up next, we discuss all things chicken with Jacques Pépin. That's right after the break. This is Mill Street Radio. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Perhaps no one knows their way around a chicken quite like Jacques Pépin. Just listen to Julia Child in 1999, admiring his work on their show, Julia and Jacques Cooking at Home. 
That's a beautiful color, Jack, and the skin looks crisp, but not too much, so. Yes, and it smells real good, just out of the oven. And I notice, as you're carving the white meat, that it all stays together. Yes, yes, you know, when the chicken has been frozen, sometimes it tends to break apart, but this was a nice, fresh chicken. Mmm, but look, and it smells so delicious. Mmm, I agree with you. Tender and perfect. Yes. Mm. I can't wait to eat it. Jacques Pépin is, of course, the world-famous French chef with more than 30 cookbooks to his name. He's also starred in countless episodes of television and can paint as well as he can cook. His latest book is Jacques Pépin, The Art of Chicken, a master chef's painting stories and recipes of the humble bird. Jacques, welcome to Milk Street. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about your early days to begin with. You were an apprentice at a restaurant beginning at the age of 13. So even by the time you were 15, you felt you had some seniority in the restaurant kitchen, right? Well, absolutely, because as an apprentice at that time, there was a great deal of manual labor, a lot of plucking of chicken, scaling fish, uh, all of that type of uh, work we, we did. I mean, the meat did not come like it does now, uh, you know, all cut up and all separated and so forth. So uh, as an apprentice, they start you doing that type of manual labor and through countless repeat, 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 repeat. I mean, it becomes part of your DNA. Right. You know, you don't even have to think about it. When you are 13, 14, 15, you know, the chef said, do this. You would never have said why. If you had said why, you would have said you because I just told you. That's how at the end of the explanation. You know, so. I think when you started, you were cooking on coal stoves, right? Right. I once cooked on a coal stove I had in Boston for a while. I, I actually fell in love with it. But, but still, could you just talk, I mean, other than the polishing and the heat, what was it like to cook on a coal stove? Well, when I worked at the Plaza Athene in Paris, we were 48 chefs. There were four big stoves like this. The guy who was in charge of the stove better know what he's doing because, mm. you know, there was no thermostat on the oven. And on one side, the guy was cooking a fish, and the other side, it may have been a souffle, you know. So you open the door, you move the dish closer to the door, you move it back, you work with the food itself. But if you screw up, and at uh, 12 o'clock when people sit down, that stove is not really hot. Well, that push all of the, the dishes back for like 10, 15, 20 minutes, and the chef gets totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and in the afternoon, of course, before the people come back at five o'clock, you take some of those ashes and start the stove again. So, I mean, the whole process of working with the stove this way was a whole apprenticeship in itself, something that doesn't exist anymore. And it was very important because, I mean, you know, if you screw up, I mean, the whole kitchen, uh, you would hear it. I mean, oh boy. Was the relationship between you and the chef when you started out, was that relationship very different than you think it is in today's restaurants? Uh, I mean, what, was it was it tough love, you know, that on one hand, they were very supportive, on the other hand, they were very tough. Is Are there things you miss about that relationship between apprentice and chef? No, this is what a team is all about, you know. And certainly for me, there is so many shows now where there is so much yelling at people and terrorizing people. I mean, there is no way you can learn how to cook this way. Of course, you have to have discipline, structure in the kitchen, and the, the, the chef in the kitchen is like the, the captain, you know, at the helm of the boat. If he says it goes this way, it goes this way. You don't ask any question. This is the chef, and that's how we do it here. Uh, each time I tell a young chef, certainly the best thing for you is to work with a good chef, but try to see the food, the taste of it, as well as the look of it, through the eye of that chef. Whether your sense of aesthetic or your sense of taste is different, it's totally immaterial. You will learn by looking through the eye of that chef. And you do that for a couple of years. Then you move to another chef. Then you move to another one. And after three or four chefs like that, you know, you have absorbed an enormous amount of uh, not only point of view, but technique as well. Ultimately, you're going to do your own thing. Because as a chef, you cannot escape yourself. But at the beginning, it's very (laughs) good to have so many point of view, work for so many different chefs and look at it through their eyes. That's how you learn. You know, so I think. So you come to New York and you said vegetables were revered in Paris. They were grilled over a live fire. While in New York, the job of vegetables was given to the lowest ranked chef and guests could only order them a la carte. So what other differences did you see between France and New York? 
uh, I live on 50th and 1st Avenue. And that's when I went to see my first supermarket. There was no supermarket in France. And I thought it was a fantastic idea to have everything under one roof. Makes much more sense, almost like a mini market. But uh, there was only one salad. That was iceberg. You know, there was no leak, no shallot. <laughs> uh, I remember asking for mushroom and they say IL-5 and that was the canned mushroom. I mean, you didn't have any fresh mushroom. So look at the supermarket today in America. I've never been as beautiful as they are today. There is like, yeah, well, at the market this morning, it was like eight different types of mushroom. I have to say most of them have no taste, but, uh, you know, so. Yeah, I was going to say, they look, they look good, but, uh, well, you know, I, I started going to New York in the 60s, and there were all the great French restaurants there. I miss that experience. I just miss everything about it. Is that something you miss, or you think it's time to move on? No, to a certain extent, it's true, but the world has changed. I mean, when I came here in 1959, all the great restaurants were called French, or continental restaurants, with a lot of menu in French, totally misspelled most of the time. (laughs) There was no great Chinese restaurant, no great Japanese restaurant, no great Italian restaurant. Italian restaurant were more a meatball, did that good stuff, but nothing fancy. So uh, the amount of ethnicity that we have here and the explosion that we've had in the last three or four decennies, you know, uh, have been absolutely amazing. So now the French doesn't have probably the prestige and uh, the, the unique play that it used to have at that point, you know, in the mind of people. So you did Art of the Chicken, and your illustrations are, I mean, they're just phenomenal. Thank you. And you're also known for hand-painting your dinner menus. It's just absolutely, you know, delightful work. Thank you. You know, we started, well, I was married 54 years, so for more than 50 years. In fact, I did two menus this morning. We have people coming next week. So this is my 13th or 14th book of menu. We have those menus where people sign on the other page for over half a century, where I have my mother, my wife, many, many people who are gone uh, mm-hmm. in my family. And I realized that the illustration, and I was you know, using a fair amount of chicken, so I decided to <laughs> extrapolate the, ch- <laughs> the chickens. You have an ultimate meal in the book, and I thought it was interesting that it's a roast chicken with salad and boiled potatoes. Uh, Could you just talk about that? I I found that charming. Yeah, I I used to do that at BU, you know, at Boston University for the student. So, you know, it was a roast chicken done with a natural juice uh, of the chicken and then that boiled potato and a salad. And then you have uh, 15 students usually we have. They have 15 chicken. They have the same ingredient. They have to go to the stove and do it. And I used to say, please, please don't try to blow my mind. I know you're going to try to blow my mind and do this and that to be different <laughs> than the guy next to you. There is 15 people here. I will have like 15 different chickens, so two or three practically perfect. A couple of them undercooked, but they will be different because that's the way things are. You know? So you don't have to torture yourself to be different. Well, as you say, you can't escape yourself, which I love. Um, so, okay, let, let's let's talk about cooking a chicken. Number one, stuffing herbs, half a lemon in a cavity. My experience, which is a fraction of yours, is that really doesn't do anything. Like you can't taste it in the meat. But but you, I think, think you should stuff something in the cavity. So wh- why do you do it? When you do a sample roast chicken, as we do, and people put herbs in it or lemon peel, I agree with you, it doesn't really do anything at all. Yeah. But to stuff the chicken under the skin, like a truffle or whatever, like right. that will give a different yeah. taste to the chicken. Okay. But if you do a regular uh, dressing like you do for a turkey, whether it's for uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving or whatever, either I, I bone out a chicken and do a galantine or then I cook the, the, the stuffing separate. You are famous for your knife skills with a chicken. How do you bone out a chicken? I mean, it, I, I know it's hard to describe in words, but most people would find that an impossible task. Yeah, it's certainly not easy to, to bone out a chicken. Uh, the biggest problem is that people don't realize there is the joint of the shoulder and the joint of the hip. You have to cut the two joints of the hip and the two of the shoulder. The rest of it you pull because there is nothing it's not attached to. It's only attached to those places. So if I cut there, grab it, pull it out, the whole thing comes out of the carcass in the 
Well, usually, like a minute or so, the big carcass is out. How do you do the leg? You essentially pull the bone out from the meat? Yeah, you, you cut the hip bone. You cut around so that you can hold it with your hand, and then you scrape it. It scrapes, 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 until you get to the knee. And at that point, you don't cut it at the articulation because you have nothing to hold it. You cut around the articulation itself, and when you have cut around, then you scrape the lower part. And at that point, I usually cut the bone inside, leaving the end of the drumstick attached to it, because if you cut it there with a knife, then the skin shrinks back. So here I, I break it too, and then I trim it after it's cooked so the, the skin doesn't shrink back this way. I'm not bad with a knife, but that's so far above my skill level. Um, okay, so let's talk about a few of the recipes in the book. Uh, the vinegar chicken I love. Could you just talk about that? I think that's just a great recipe. Yeah, that's a specialty of Lyon, and uh, I use uh, the Thai usually. And the way I cook the chicken very often is I start them in a non stick pan, thin side down, a bit of salt on top, that's it. Because I cook it probably 25 oh. minutes without moving it. I cook it four or five minutes on relatively high heat and it starts frying. And I mm -hmm. put a lid on top on very low heat so that I can cook it only skin side down for 25 minutes. Uh, of course, deglazed with a bit of uh, red wine vinegar, garlic and fresh tomato and often tarragon at the end. So it's extremely simple, extremely sophisticated in some way. You also write, I thought this this is just wonderful. You said, despite all our squabbles, Julie and I agreed on the important things. Recipes should be simple, taste Trump's presentation. Cooking together should be fun, use the highest quality ingredients, uh, share food, drink wine, plenty of wine. So eventually it all comes down to the simple things, right? Yeah, you'd be absolutely amazed in those three-star restaurants that I worked. Uh, the guy worked the whole night, the whole kitchen, and everyone sit down after, get the cheese out, get the saucisson, the bread, butter, and don't eat any of the stuff that you do. And frankly, I, I've eaten in some of the greatest restaurants in the world by far, but uh, if I think of great meals that I've had, I usually come to think of my parents or my wife or my kid and... Uh, uh, certain friends eating together on a special occasion. That's what you remember are the great meal of your life, in my opinion, at least, uh, more than uh, the great meal of restaurant, you know. Yeah, that's, I could not agree more. Jacques, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's been a great pleasure and it's been too long. Thank you very much for having me and happy cooking. Okay. <laughs> That was Jacques Pépin. His latest book is Jacques Pépin, Art of the Chicken, a master chef's paintings, stories, and recipes of the humble bird. You can find Jacques' recipes for his ultimate meal on our website at MilkStreetRadio.com. A few of us achieve complete mastery of a craft. Jerry Garcia on Eyes of the World, Aretha Franklin singing Amazing Grace, or Fred Astaire tap dancing. They make it look really easy. Watching Jacques Pépin cooking is the same thing. Watching him bone a chicken on YouTube is like listening to Miles Davis on Kind of Blue. He works by feel, not memory. Malcolm Gladwell claimed that to be an artist, you need 10,000 hours of practice. But great food requires more than practice. It lives in the sweet spot between the right and left brains, between emotion and knowledge, between art and craft. Or as Jerry Garcia once sang, once in a while, you get shown the light in the strangest of places if you look at it right. This is Mill Street Radio. Coming up, Alex I News offers a very French take on the very American hamburger. That's coming up in just a moment. This is Milk Street Radio. Now it's time to chat with Lynn Clark about this week's recipe, chickpea flour flatbread. Lynn, how are you? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you? I'm pretty good. You know, people messing around with pizza is sort of my thing today, like cauliflower crust. I don't get it. It's one of the things I don't get. But I like flatbreads a lot. I just made a bunch this weekend. It's just one of those great mysteries why America, that is the United States, really doesn't have much tradition in flatbreads. But it's one of those things you find in almost every country, right? 
That's absolutely right. These chickpea flour flatbreads we're going to talk about today are called soca in France. They also make them in Italy. They even make them in India. And they're super, super simple to put together. And not only are they great as a, you know, sort of a flatbread on its own, but they're really great if you add some toppings to them, a la cauliflower crust. Uh, But these have so much more flavor because they've got that great chickpea flavor. What's the deal with chickpea flour? You know, why not just use regular flour? Is it just because it adds so much flavor to it or does it do something to the texture too? No, it adds flavor, but it's also a great gluten-free alternative uh, to wheat flour. And it's super simple to do these flatbreads. So you're just taking chickpea flour and warm water. And warm water is kind of important here because we want the batter to be a little bit thicker and warmer water will make a thicker batter. Salt and pepper, whisk that together. It's equal parts of chickpea flour and water, which is great because that means it's super simple to scale up or down. Then we add a little bit of olive oil to that. That's going to add a little bit of that richness, a little fat in there. So there's no yeast in this? There's no yeast. There's no baking powder. It's a true flat bread. It's a crepe. I mean, it can be similar to a crepe, depending on how thick you pour your batter in the pan and how much oil you add to the pan can make it crispier or softer. We like them kind of crispy, so we use a nonstick skillet because, as you said, it's more of a batter than it is a dough, so it can stick. And then a decent amount of oil so that it gets really crispy and almost fries in that oil. A couple minutes on each side, and it's literally finished. Pull it off and then top it, sort of to your heart's content, but you do have to be kind of minimalist. This is a thin flatbread crust. It's not a big fluffy pizza crust that you can pile a bunch of stuff on. Really going minimalist here is kind of essential. You know, just to make a side comment, people don't use enough oil in skillets, right? Because if (laughs) you use enough oil, you can really cover the bottom of the pan. Things don't stick. It's almost, it's not shallow frying, but it's... No, but it it, does help get that kind of crispy and and more sturdy so that you can top it with some really delicious things. We have a couple of really great recipes on the website. One is an olive and roasted red pepper relish. The other is spinach, grape, and feta salad. I think like arugula and prosciutto. So... If I have a choice between cauliflower crust and crispy chickpea flour flatbread, I think I'm definitely going with the chickpea flour. And what I love is there's no yeast. It's just you cook it in a skillet in a few minutes. It really is almost a last-minute recipe, right? It's amazing, and you can make a ton of them in a really short amount of time. It's really great. Lynn, thank you. Crispy chickpea flour flatbread, even a Tuesday night supper. Thank you. You're welcome. You can get the recipe for chickpea flour flatbread at MilkStreetRadio.com. This is Milk Street Radio. Next up, let's check in with our Paris correspondent, Alex Inews. Hey, Alex, what's uh, going on in Paris? Uh, Well, I I, I feel very French today, and I'm throwing a party later on today. And uh, I thought I should share something with you, a recipe that performs particularly well on French people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You'd be maybe surprised to learn that it's based around the burger. What? Yes, French people love their burger, but I made sure not to make enemies, to include some French flavors. So basically what I did, I, I made a French bourguignon burger. I am sure you must be familiar with beef bourguignon that's slow cooked. You know, I spent m- most of the 1970s cooking beef bourguignon. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I'm retired now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I don't have enough time to make it. Anymore. No, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very time-consuming recipe. But yes, I, yes. I made sure to make it a little shorter, but also a little more modern in some ways. Hmm. So usually I start, obviously, with uh, the right cut of beef. In, in my case, there are only two cuts of beef, which I accept for beef bourguignon. The first one is beef cheek, ox cheek. Uh-huh. And the second one is ox tail. My favorite is obviously ox tail, but it's a little messy to eat. So I'm going to focus on ox cheek, which is going to be easier for me to, to build a burger on afterwards. Okay. Can, can, can I just point out that yes. in typical French fashion, the first ingredient you mentioned is something nobody can get here. 
So can we just, <laughs> is it? I mean, just like you've already started out being difficult. So, so let, let, let me provide you with a, a few alternatives. Okay. So chuck would be a good one, shank or, or brisket. Brisket could be amazing. How about boneless beef ribs? That uh, would be brilliant. Probably even better, to be honest. Yeah. So this you want to marinate, okay? You want to marinate this with onions, with carrots, with a bouquet garni, so thyme, uh, a few other herbs, and, and, and a lot of red wine. Okay. So basically, once the beef has been marinated, you, you just sear it in a big pot uh, or, or in a pressure cooker, which is usually my go-to because it's just much faster. You sear mm -hmm. it first, then you add all the liquid from the marinade. You add a bit of flour just for thickening purposes. And then you basically cook this for a few hours. There is no trick in beef bourguignon. It really is mostly a good cut of beef. I mean, I mean, a cheap cut, which for some could be considered a bad cut. But in fact, for me, it's a good cut uh, and, and loads of wine and loads of thyme. Uh, at, at the end of this, you're left with more or less a beef bourguignon already. But how, how about all those annoying little pearl onions and the mushrooms? I discard them because they're just Thank you. Annoying. Thank you. No, <laughs> it's because I'm lazy. <laughs> they're, they're annoying. Yeah. Okay. But if, if, if Jacques Pépin were to be in the room, he would be offended. I don't think so. I, I think he's a pretty practical no, you're guy, right. actually. You're right. Yeah, and I, he, he, he wouldn't be offended yeah. by this. He's a very yeah. cool guy. He's a cool guy. But, but uh, in, you know, in, in all my laziness, I just discard the pearl onions because you have to caramelize them and you have to roll yeah, them. And, uh, it's just a pain. However, I tend to include a bit of lardon, so bacon bits, in mm -hmm. my beef bourguignon because I feel like it's adding an, another layer of flavor. Now, right. to get back to the burger, basically you've got a base which is pretty rich at the moment. Uh, so what you want to do is to brighten that thing. In this case, I'm going carrots, but I'm pickling carrots in, mm. you know, a, a pickling juice. So this is going to be my acid. Then I'm going to have super thin, almost like mandolin thin slices of raw mushroom. Okay. So just to sum up the blasphemy that I just did, because I think it's a blasphemy to, to some extent. I said, I've got raw mushrooms. I've got pickled carrots. I've got a, some fried bacon. And the main piece, it's just a slab, a round slab of ox cheek, which is super tender. So it's going to be almost like ground beef, but it's not ground beef. It's just a slab. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to get a knock at your door, and it's going to be Auguste Escoffier. <laughs> And he's going to just go after you for doing this. Well, you know that's what's going to happen. If, 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 it, if it's not Auguste Escoffier, he might be just an American guy just saying, this is not a burger. This that's is everything. True. This is, <laughs> what do you think? This, is this just a steak sandwich or is it a burger? Well, this is like arguing about whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. You know, it, it, I think a hot dog is a sandwich for sure. Yeah, I think so too. I, look, I think it's between a, you know, a top and bottom burger bun. It's a burger. I, mm. I'm with you. Yeah, it's mm. a burger. Yeah. I like the idea of, you know, classic brioche bun. And I'm going to make sure to use as much sauce as possible because I feel like beef bourguignon, more than all the flavors I've mentioned before, is about the sauce. A, a deep, dark, red, shiny, glistening sauce, which is often, you know, finished, you, you, you must know this, with a few uh, pieces of chocolate. What? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very classic thing. You, you're not aware of this? No, I'd never heard of that before. Get out of here. That's, yeah, cool. that's impossible. That, 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 that's like the classic grandma move. Like uh, oh. 30 minutes before serving, they would add like two, three pieces of chocolate to really? beef bourguignon just to make it darker, richer, and, and a touch sweeter. That's, uh, that's a new one on me. Well, I mean, let me say two things. It, it takes a French cook to take a simple concept, which is... <laughs> <laughs> cook a burger on the grill and turn it into a two to four hour, you know, culinary experience. But I have to say you have upgraded. So a couple of years from now, Alex, when, when you have your food empire, mm -hmm. you're going to have the Bourguignon Burger Hut. That could work. <laughs> I, I can see this on a menu. It would be a hit. It, it, it's a bit of a nonsense in terms of a burger is supposed to be easy and down to earth. and But... I wouldn't say no to a beef bourguignon burger. No, it, it sounds great. And by the way, you could make it fast food. <laughs> I can make a, it fast food. Exactly. Just a, make a 50-gallon pressure cooker. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. My Alex, you've, uh, you, you've changed my mind. I love a burger, but this sounds like a better burger. I just have to come to Paris to get it because I'm not doing it. <laughs> you're going to have to do it for me. It would be a pleasure for me to cook it for you next time you're in Paris. I'm coming right over. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
That was YouTube host Alex I News. He's also the author of Just a French Guy Cooking. That's it for today. You know, over the last few years, we've produced more than 200 episodes of Milk Street Radio. You can find each and every one of them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, MilkStreetRadio.com, or wherever you find your podcasts. To explore Milk Street and everything we have to offer, please go to 177MilkStreet.com. There you can download our recipes, watch our TV show, and learn about our magazine and our latest cookbook, Cook What You Have. You can also find us on Facebook at Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, on Instagram and Twitter at 177 Milk Street. We'll be back next week with more food stories and kitchen questions. And thanks, as always, for listening. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is produced by Milk Street in association with GBH. Co-founder, Melissa Baldino. Executive producer, Annie Sinsaba. Senior editor, Melissa Allison. Producer, Sarah Clapp. Assistant producer, Caroline Davis, with production help from Debbie Paddock. Additional editing by Sydney Lewis. Audio mixing by Jay Allison at Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Theme music by Chew Bob Crew. Additional music by George Brindle Egloff. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is distributed by PRX. PRX.